today on Soul Work for Moms. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to be interviewed for a radio show, and the host asked me to share some steps that a mother can take to grow personally and spiritually. My answer was this, start by speaking your truth, sharing your journey, and listen to the truths and the journeys of others. Today, we listen to part of the life journey of Nancy Simpson, a mother of five grown children with ages ranging between 30 and 44. Nancy is a retired psychotherapist who spent most of her career in criminal justice, where she worked in a prison with repeat male felons, a career that she started after being a stay-at-home mom while her children were at home. Nancy has a heart of gold and cares deeply for those who are suffering. This episode is an important one for a couple of reasons. First, it deals with spousal abuse. Nancy does not go into detail of the abuse, but acknowledges that it was there. This is a suffering far too many women experience in silence. And while I do not feel qualified to direct women specifically in these situations of what exactly they should do, I do feel it's important to share the stories of women who have gone through it. The second reason I think today's episode is important is that Nancy lived quite a wealthy lifestyle. It's a lifestyle that not many of us can relate to, and I think that it's a lifestyle that some may even judge and perhaps write off the struggles and wisdom of those living it. Of course, the opposite could be true as well. Some of us may aspire to live that lifestyle with daydreams of, if only I had that house or that husband or that bank account, life would be easy. This episode, for me, highlights the fact that while we may not all live the same way, we all have pain and we all have wisdom to share. We open with Nancy describing what life was like for her as a child. I think my family life as a child really molded everything that came after that. My father was a PhD and a doctor, and he did research for the National Institute of Health. And as such, he would be at various medical schools on research grants. So I lived all over the United States as a child, Chicago, Milwaukee, Philadelphia, just all over. And What happened was I learned early on that I would be leaving. I was always leaving. I was leaving my bedroom, my home, my neighborhood, my school, and my friends. And when you're little, what that leaving of friends means is that back then we did stamps and envelopes and letters And when I was in the fourth grade or fifth grade, girlfriends would write, but then inevitably the letters would stop and the girlfriends would become a memory. And so I developed an existential angst about life, about abandonment, about friends, about leaving people. And I think I became, um, I became lonely inside of myself because I had no roots, I had no hometown, and I had no friends that I had known forever. So that no doubt influenced who you became as a mother, I'm sure. Did you always know that you wanted to have children? I was not somebody who dreamed about being a mother. I was not somebody who couldn't wait to get married and have babies. I, um, I just wasn't. And I got married very young. I was 19 and I was in college and I had my first baby at 22. And what happened for me was I fell in love with that baby. When I had Aaron, my world shifted my heart shifted, my consciousness shifted. And really, for the first time in my life, I felt I was not alone on the earth. I, for the first time in my life, I think I really felt unabandoned joy. I was just 
my world was filled with light where before it had been kind of this shadowy, angsty aloneness. With Aaron came pure joy. Wow, that is so fascinating to me how some women experience this, as you say, unabandoned joy, and some women experience quite the opposite after having children. Uh, That was probably quite a surprise for you. Were there any other surprises that occurred for you after becoming a mother? I am what I consider a lipstick girl. I love lipstick. I love purses. I love shoes. I love hair. I love every single thing about being a girly girl. And what took me by surprise is that this girly girl loved being a mother. I mean, nobody who knows me now or who knew me then would think this is the kind of girl that popped out five babies. Are you kidding? That girl, five babies? Because, I mean, these babies wiped their nose on my dresses and they threw up in my fancy car and they this and that. And I loved every moment of it. I kept having children because I loved these babies so much. And looking back on it, I think that I, in part, had those children to create a world that I never had as a child. I had my own city with my children. I had my own world, my own people who loved me, and it was warm and nurturing and just awesome. That's a really good self-awareness of how that joy was linked to your childhood. And it sounds like you had a really positive experience of motherhood. Um, Were there any low points at all during those years of having children at home? I was married twice. I was married the first time for about 20 years, and all of my children were with my first husband. When he left, when we divorced, I had a two-year-old, a four-year-old, a six-year-old, an eight-year-old, and a 12-year-old. And I was in Cincinnati, and I had recently moved here. I had few, if any, friends. I had no family whatsoever. My husband moved out of state, leaving me with five babies all by myself. And it was a time of utter terror. There were too many children for just me with no support. With five babies, I could not go shopping at Kroger. I could barely leave the house. It was an extremely difficult time. And what got you through that time? I think that I muddled through it, and by some quirk of fate, I met a man, um, and we started dating, and I fell madly in love with him on date one, just madly in love with him. Um, He was very successful, and on our first date, I'll never forget this, he said to me, have you ever been to a motion picture premiere? I'm like, a motion picture premiere. And he's like, yeah. And I go, I don't, what do you mean? And he said, well, I invested in a motion picture and um, was wondering if you wanted to go to the premiere with me. And I'm thinking to myself, "Ah, ah, ah, I said like in Hollywood. And he's like, yeah. And so on the outside, I'm going, oh, that, that sounds like it'd be great fun. And inside I'm going, ah, I can't believe this. But anyway, so what happened was, how do you, as a mother with five children, young babies, tell a man, I have five children? Because everybody told me, they said, nobody's going to marry you with five kids. You just have to deal with it. You have to get used to the idea. You, That's not going to happen. So with that in my mind, he would say, how many kids do you have? And I would go, So tell me, what did you do for a living again? Or 
do you have boys or girls? I would say, oh, I'm, some of which, but did you hear it was going to be a snowstorm tomorrow? So for maybe the first two months, he had no idea how many children I had. And I realized at some point he was going to have to know. And was that a seamless transition? Yes, it was a seamless transition. It was beyond a fairy tale. And I mean, even saying it on the podcast, it seems too fairy tale ish to be real. But the man said to me, we were living on the west side of Cincinnati, which is um, kind of a, a blue collar ish, not meaning to demean the area, but just just an average, lovely neighborhood of families. And the man said to me, I would really like you to be living someplace uh, bigger, maybe better, maybe closer to me. I want you to buy a house. And I'm like, what? And he said, yeah, I want you to buy a house and I'll pay for it. And I said, well, how much, what is my price range? And he said, no price range. I said, what do you mean no price range? He said, get anything you want. And so I bought a seven acre estate and I moved in with my five children to palatial splendor. It was a fairy tale and he married me and fairy tale. It was a fairy tale, but you're not married today. Not married today. I've been divorced for 15 years. And having the fairy tale and then having that at some point come to an end, again, with five children at home, what does that do to you? Fairy tales are usually fairy tales. So that the man who was a multimillionaire and extremely successful was also someone who... um, who once he had the family, he was no longer interested in the family. And he went back to his life of travel, of work, and we were pretty much utterly ignored. And I was grateful for the home, for the schools, for what he provided for me. But back then, I was in my late 30s, and I was um, I was unrealistic about life. And I felt that I could have everything. I could have all of that monetary gain, and I could have a husband who was attentive. And life doesn't work out like that. Um, When I became maybe a little bit demanding, he became abusive. And I stayed in the marriage too long with the abuse because with five children and never having worked, I could not envision myself anywhere but there. I became utterly paralyzed thinking I could not leave, not with five kids. What would I do? How would I live? Et cetera, et cetera. What was it then that gave you the strength to say, I can leave the fairy tale, I will leave? How did you do that? My father passed away and left me some money. I took every cent of that money, and with five children at home, I went back to school full-time, and I got um, a degree in a behavioral science field, a master's degree, and with that degree and working so hard to get that degree, I felt it was my ticket out. Even after I got the degree... I could not envision leaving, physically leaving. And what happened was there was a very um, tragic incident with one of my children, with an older man. 
and my daughter was in high school. And at some point, people were saying to her, why, why? And she looked at me and she said these words to me. She said, you don't understand. You just don't get it. He was nice to me. And when she said that, I had a paradigm crack, just a crack. And I realized what the cost was of being in a marriage with a man, a stepfather, who was not nice to her. And I saw on her face in that moment the cost. And it was the look on her face when she said that that made me know that I had to leave. And within a month, I had found um, a condominium and I had found a mover and I had told my husband that I was leaving and the, he didn't believe me. He said, you'll never leave all this. Are you kidding? What would you do? He laughed. He just laughed. And I said, I'm really going. And he goes, no, you're not. And I go, I am. And it wasn't until the day that that moving van showed up that he stood on the lawn in utter shock and I did leave. So I admit that when I started to interview Nancy, I knew she was divorced, but I had no idea that abuse had been part of her journey. Since it's come up, I feel a responsibility to provide resources for anyone who is suffering in an abusive relationship of any kind. There are links in the show notes, but you can also go visit ncadv.org. That's the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, ncadv.org. They have examples of abusive tendencies, plan ahead steps, personalized safety plans, and a ton more. Also, the National Domestic Violence Hotline in the U.S. is 1-800-799-SAFE, 1-800-799-7233. I've also included links in the show notes to some websites that discuss teen dating violence, which if you are a mother, you will almost definitely be parenting teenagers at some point. So I would encourage you to take a look at those. Let's get back to our interview with Nancy. Wow, Nancy, that takes so much courage and so much strength to not stay out of fear for losing that fairy tale life that you spoke of. What did you learn about yourself in doing something that you didn't think you had the strength to do? I have learned through almost all of the painful, tragic experiences of my life that we can do what we set our heart, our soul, and our mind to do, that somehow, some way, we do have the strength to walk through the gates of hell itself if we need to, and especially if we need to do it for our children. We can do anything. And I have learned throughout my life that I can do anything with the help of friends, with the help of my inner strength, the universe, God, angels, whatever you name the forces that affect human beings, we together can do anything. We can move mountains if we need to. We have this, this magic, these miracles inside of us that in very hard times can manifest and can take us on their wings to the next place we need to be. Those are really, really beautiful words. And to hear them coming from someone who has already raised her children, gone through some really tough times, and is now on the other side of it, sharing her truth with us is so inspirational. I'd like to know what is something that we might be surprised to know about you now? People might be surprised because I am a pretty girl, I am a happy girl, I am a fun girl. People might be surprised to know that when I left that marriage for the next 15 years, I did not have a partner and I was never in a love relationship for 15 years. And um, my husband told me when I divorced 
that husband, I had a lot of gratitude, even though he was abusive and even though he had done some very horrible things, I was eternally grateful that he married me with five children. I was eternally grateful that he gave us such a beautiful home and that my children got to go to Indian Hill schools and I would always be grateful to him. But um, he, and, and in that gratitude, when I left, I said, I do not, I don't want anything from you. I want to make it on my own. Um, and we just used one attorney. I said, I don't even want my own attorney. Just get one attorney. I don't want anything. I'll sign anything that you, so we didn't even have a mediator with two attorneys. We just used a single attorney. And, um, the surprise is he told that attorney, he said, this girl can't make it on her own. She will be married. She's never even worked. She, barely puts gas in her own car. She'll be married within a year. She, she could never survive on her own. And all my friends and my mom, everyone thought I would be married within a year or so. But 15 years later, here I am, still a single girl. That goes right along with the theme that we've been hearing so much in these interviews is that motherhood gives us a strength that we did not before realize that we had, don't you think? Yes. I want to hear who one or two women are who inspire you. Number one would be Princess Diana. And I say Princess Diana because she had such a good heart. And her heart was so full of dreams. And she met her prince. And her life was, she had her babies. And her life was just, she was a princess married to a prince. And like me and my prince, her prince turned out to be a nightmare. And from day one, he was in love with another woman and he, he flaunted it. And um, she became depressed to the point of suicide because her husband didn't love her and her husband loved another woman and he let her know that he loved another woman. And she just, she she couldn't bear the pain of that. And she found the strength to leave a prince despite the disdain of the royalty, the king and the, and the consort of England. She left anyway. And not only did she leave, but she then decided, she made a choice in strength and love I am going to use my life to do good things to those people on the earth who need it. And so she devoted her life to holding sick babies, to walking in minefields that had explosives. She took her life and she did incredibly good things with it. And she took her pain and she took her sorrow and like with alchemy, she changed it into the gold of loving and serving other people. So she would be one hero. Another one is Mother Teresa, because Mother Teresa decided, I am going to take my life on earth, and every single day I am going to live for the most needy, the weakest, the sick, and the dying, and I'm going to pour myself out for them, unto them, and she serves in this, as an example to all of us as to what it looks like to pour out our very being for the benefit of those weak among us. Mm, Princess Diana and Mother Teresa, both very inspirational women. We're going to start wrapping up now. And so I'd like to ask you, what is the one thing that you would like your children to know? Oh, that made me cry. The one, the one thing that I want my children to know is that with every fiber of my being, I love them. And that in this world and in the next world, no matter where I 
might end up, that my children were my heart, and that every cell in my body, every bone, sinew, muscle, every part of me loved those children more than life itself. And our last question for today, Nancy, what is one thing that you would like all mothers to know? When I was in graduate school and I was taking a course on uh, the development of a child and how a child develops, there was a seminal study done by um, Cohote, and his study was on, and it was like for decades, but it was, what is there a variable? Is there something in parenting that elicits an outcome of a successfully functioning adult by self-report? Adults who report that they are successful, that they are happy. They did this huge study of what is there any common variable in these, in these highly functioning, happy adults. And they looked at everything like, were the parents happily married? Did you eat meals together? Did you live in a, uh, you know, one place? Did you have brothers? They looked at everything and they found there was only one variable that was clinically significant that stood out from all the rest. And Cohote euphemistically termed it the gleam in the mother's eye. And what he meant by that was that when the mother looked at the child, she saw this incredible being of wonder and that her heart was just completely enraptured by this being. And Cohote said, even a blind mother can give their child this gift of wonderment by her voice and how she touched the child. And so the, the, um, the one thing that I have learned is that how we see our children as perfect in who they are, how they manifest on the earth, their little personalities, even if a child is difficult, rebellious, rambunctious, these are perfectly holy beings. And our one job as mothers is to look at these children and see beyond the acting out, see beyond them driving us crazy, see beyond the behavioral faults to that core of the holy, perfect child. And when a mother can see their children with eyes of love, that is the best gift you can give a child. And it is the variable that statistically will help your child become all they can be. It's the gleam in the mother's eye. Oh, young mothers, when you look at your babies, your children, your teenagers, look past all of their acting out, driving you crazy, pulling your... See that glorious, beautiful, perfect soul that your child truly is. The gleam in the mother's eye. Nancy, thank you so much for sharing your story so vulnerably. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. And thank you so much for the advice that you give to all of us to see our children for the beautiful beings that they are. I really appreciate you being with us today. Thank you. I loved every second of it. Thank you. Okay, mamas, if you've been listening to previous episodes, you know that it's time for our soul work action step. This week's action step is to write down the times that you have had to call on your inner strength. We can often think of those times in a negative way, as in this happened to me, but we can also think of them in an empowered way, as in when this happened, I showed my strength by... Changing our mindset or reminding ourselves that we are strong gives us the courage and the knowledge that we can take on life's challenges. We do not have to live in fear. 
As always, this action step is at the top of this week's sheet, which can be found on soulworkformoms.com under the show notes for today's episode or under the free gifts tab. I've also put in today's show notes links to support for women experiencing domestic abuse, as I mentioned earlier. Nancy also wanted to include a link to a book that she recommends. It's called Broken and Battered, also in the show notes. Next week, we hear from a yoga teacher who, by the time she found out she was pregnant, they were already able to tell her the baby's sex and how getting on that yoga mat has changed her life. Let me remind you, you matter. We need your courage and we need your strength. When you grow and heal your wounds, you heal not only yourself, but your children and the world. And that is evolution through mothering. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next week.